Let's go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. We're on verse 7. We're looking at the last section, the last part of chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. John is going to present the second to the last test. After this section, there's only one more section, and then he's finished. He's going to give you this test, one more test, and he's done. And the letter's closed. Now, we, we learned, we've been learning that the reason why John wrote this was to encourage Christians in, in the fact that they know that they know that they know that they're going to heaven, that they truly know they're saved. Here we go. No, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll read it out loud for you. Okay, you just follow along. Starting in verse 7 of chapter 4. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love for us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment, because in this world we are like him. This, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment, and one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Okay. That's page 1902. Here's the dilemma. What does, what does John use as the example, the model for our understanding of love? God's love. How was God's love shown to us, according to First John? Huh? He gave us a son. For what purpose? To die for us. So what is the ultimate demonstration of God's love? Sacrifice. The, starts with a C. The crucifixion, the cross. The cross is the ultimate picture of God's love. It defines Love. It shapes love. It gives us the picture of God's love. What is God's love like? Well, look at the cross. And he says in the first part of this, uh, if you look starting like verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Why? What is the basis of us loving one another? God's love for us shown on the cross. So here's the picture. Here's my dilemma. We wear crosses all the time. On chains. We hang them on our walls. We put them above our churches. We talk about, you know, every Easter, Easter week, we talk about 
Jesus crucified and his resurrection, it becomes so old, so common, that I don't know that we truly understand the significance and the depth and the purpose and the intention and all that was wrapped up in what happened on the cross. So before we go, this is, this is my dilemma. Before we go into, okay, we're supposed to love one another, and it's because Jesus died on the cross and that's how God showed his love. That's, I, I think that our love for one another would be just as shallow as our understanding of Christ's love and God's love demonstrated on the cross. Whatever we understand about the cross, that depth of love is the maximum love we can possibly show to one another. Does that make sense? Do you understand that, what I'm saying? That, that logic? Yeah it's, like yeah, it's like a seesaw. Exactly. If I have... Let's put it this way. If I give you, if you, or let's do this with a child. Christmas. Every one of us has had this happen to us one time at least in our life. Christmas and the parents give you the one gift that you so wanted. I mean, it was the $350, $500 thingamajiggy, widget, gadget, gamey thing, whatever, and you, you knew in the back of your head it cost money, but it, it, the money part didn't quite register. All you knew is you got your gift. You got it, whatever it was, right? Okay, you grew up. Now it's time for you to give gifts. And your, your child comes to you and says, Oh, Mom. Oh, Dad. I want that one gidget dually, that thing, whatever. And... You go, oh, 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 I don't know what that is, but okay, let's take a look. And you go to the store and you go online, and it's a $1,600 gadget. And what, is, what do you feel in your, inside you when that happens? I was not given $1,600 presents when I was younger, so you're not going to get it. I wasn't getting, no, but I was given $500, $300, $100. I remember getting a, a soup can with... $100 bills wrapped around the outside under the label. And we all opened up the can. These were like pre-manufactured, but you opened up the can. Inside was like a little gadget, a little toy or whatever. I don't remember if there was like maybe 100 bucks in it. We're all, ooh, got 100 bucks. Took all the coffee cans and threw them in the garbage. And my stepdad went, <gasps> went, <coughs> just about died because there was like $500 in $100 bills wrapped inside the labels of all of these cans that we just threw in the garbage. Well, the idea was is when you were a child, $500 doesn't mean anything to you, so the gift doesn't mean much to you. It doesn't weigh on you the way it would with you're an adult, and now you have to pay the 500 bucks. That 500 bucks is a lot. You know, you, you, you've worked for it. You know what you had to do, how many hours you worked, how many bosses you had to, you know deal with and circumstances and you know all that how much sweat you had to deal with in order to get that 500 bucks right it means more well okay same thing with our love for one another i'm supposed i know god loves me and therefore i love you that's what john's been talking about he said it two times we've had this test twice already one in chapter two and one in chapter three if god loves you you should love your brother if you say you hate if you hate your brother you cannot the love of god doesn't exist in you all those things so here we go I know God loves me, therefore I'm supposed to love you. However, it is out of my love for the Father, it's out of my love for God, my understanding of what that is, that I can love you back. I cannot love you more than my understanding of how much God loved me. It needs, I need to feel the weight of what that is. What, did, what does it mean that God loved me? He woke up one day and said, Hmm, you look pretty cool. I'd like to hang out with you. Oh, but you know what? I've got to take care of this sin thing, so let's send Jesus to the cross 
so that you can get better and we can hang out. And that's about the depth that we have when it comes to the cross, or many people have to the cross. It's just not heavy. So, I didn't feel it would be right to go through this last love test without looking back at the cross of Christ and doing a really good study. Let's look at this part, this section in the middle that says, this is love. Love begins with God loving us, demonstrated through his son on the cross. Out of this love, we are to love one another. So I want to start there. I want to start at that cross part. You okay, Larry? No. He's not praying, is he? Yeah. You all right? Okay. If you look at this passage... The test of loving one another is in verse 7, 11, 12, 16, 20, and 21. It's all defined by the cross in verses 18 through 19. So here's your example. Go do it. Because of this, you do it. Okay? So, what do we want to do? I want to ask some questions. Why did Jesus die? Why was the cross necessary? Yeah. Because God is holy and sin had to be <laughs> Keep these in mind. There's a whole bunch of questions. How is the cross the central most event of all of history? What is God's father part in the cross? What is God father part in the cross? See, we, 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 we look at the cross and say Jesus. But that's not what was going on on the cross. Jesus just carried it. He, he bore what God Father was doing. The action was God Father. The recipient was the Son. And we tend to lose the God Father part when we think about the cross. It's very important. When Jesus said, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. Remember in the garden, guess enemy? He prays three times. Goes away. Uh, John, James, and Peter are supposed to pray. He goes off and he prays, Father, if this cup is at all possible to be taken away, you know, take it away, but not my will, but thy will be done. And then he goes back and he finds them asleep, says, can't you, you know, stay awake and pray with me for an hour? Goes back, prays again. He's agonizing. He's, he's just agonizing over it. He's, he's this is three times. And the three times, just before his arrest, just before Judas' kiss, he is so agonized by this cup, whatever this cup is, that he is so tormented that he is sweating blood. The capillaries in his skin burst under stress, and he is sweating blood. That's how, whatever's in this cup is creating, the anticipation of that cup is creating this. Whatever that cup is, take this cup away. What is that? God's wrath on the him. wrath of God. Okay. <laughs> I think there's another. <coughs> that is, for the first time, Jesus would not feel God's presence as his father. That leads into another question here. <laughs> Uh, and that is uh, what about bearing the weight of everyone's sin bearing the weight of everybody's sin here is a sinless God Jesus who now gets to become sin for us what God hates what God hates so there's, there's, there's a lot of things that are going on in this cup I want to know what does this cup look like what is in that cup and if the anticipation of the cup brings sweat of bl or blood of sweat of blood, blood of sweat, sweat, bloody sweat, <laughs> he sweats blood. In a, his, he's so agonized over this. Then what did it actually feel like? What was it actually? What did he actually endure? Standing or uh, nailed to the cross, drinking the cup. Because that's the picture. The picture is don't make me, I don't, if you, all possible, let me, let something, I don't want to drink this cup. But he drinks every last drop. 
if the anticipation creates that kind of agony, what did the actual drinking of the cup do on the cross to Christ? You get that picture? That's another one that I don't think we often think about. We think that, oh, the garden is really stressful. It's very agonizing. But the cross was something totally different. No, the cross was the actual drinking of the cup that he said, please let it go. I don't want this cup. Please let it go by. What did it mean to drink the cup of God's wrath? Being separated from God, the Father. I don't think we've even, I don't think we even could scratch the surface of what that means. I want to look at what that means. It is important to know what that means. Because it will define the love. What does a perfect sinless man, God, Jesus, if he is willing to take this, bear this on himself, then what, what, why? That's the other question. Why would he take the cup? I don't know. What does the scripture say? We're going to go look at that. What is the spirit of God right that it pleased God to crush his son? Isaiah 53. It pleased the father to crush his son on the cross. Wrap your mind around that. I Didn't he love the son? I don't know that we can. I don't know that we can understand that. But that's part, again, that's part of love. Here is the love for the son. The love for the son and the love for the father cannot ever be separated. They are one and the same. How could God father... Say, I'm going to love rebellious, sinful man, and I need you, my, I love you so much, son, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to let me pour my wrath on you so that I can love them. My love, or the Father's love for us, was great enough, some mysterious way, for him to do what he did to the son that he called his beloved, his first son. So here's a love for a son, and here's a love for us, and his love for us puts a demand on his son that is going to create major suffering. Let me pour my hate on you. So that I can love these people. Is that possible? We gotta find out. We gotta find out. Which leads to his, her question. Jesus is on the cross. It's in the second part of the he's on the cross for six hours. This is the second, third, three hour period. There's darkness covering the entire sky. There's no it's all dark. And Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Did God leave him? God turned his back on him because Jesus became sin. What does it mean to turn his back on him? No fellowship. Right. Are you, are you, are you, do we have any kind of problems here? no darkness in him. They can't cohabitate. So did he stop being God at that moment? What happened at that time? Why did he say, why did he scream in agony, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Those are questions. Those are questions that wrap up and are in this cross, in this work that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit did. Do you know the Spirit's on the cross? The Spirit's involved in the cross. Do you know who got Jesus through the cross? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave him the strength to get through the cross. Yeah. So you have the Trinity. Is it? You have the Trinity. Yes. All three persons, all three forms, all three natures are represented on the cross. God Father is smashing the Son. 
The son is standing as a substitute <coughs> sacrifice, taking the, the wrath of father on him instead of on, for on us. And the spirit is in Christ getting him through and carrying him through this moment. Here's what I want to do. I want to, if, I, if we have time, I want to look at today's, I'm going to do, we're going to do this study at least two Sundays. I'm not going to be able to cover it all today. But I want to look at the first part today, and that's the necessity of the cross. A holy God and, a, and sinful man. The necessity of the cross. Holy God, sinful man. Here's the areas. I want to talk about the character of God. I want to talk about the character of fallen man. And then I want to talk about the divine dilemma. It's a theological term called the divine dilemma. Divine meaning God, dilemma meaning there's a problem, a puzzle, something that cannot be resolved. And under that, what is that problem? What is that dilemma? What is called the divine satisfaction? And what is called the divine substitution? Okay? And here's the questions we're going we're gonna to solve, hopefully today. Questions that for this section are, why was the cross necessary? What dilemma did the cross of Christ resolve? And why is, the Christ, why is the cross God-centered, not man-centered? Why is the cross God-centered, not man-centered? Okay? So here we go. You ready? You sure? All right. You want answers? Good, so do I, because I don't have them all. Here we go. We're going to start in the first one. I want you to notice that the first thing, the cross begins with God. So I'm going to start, I'm going to start writing some notes up here. If you want to take notes, you're more than welcome to. One, the cross begins with God. All right. That's all right. I'll have a little black mark on there. I'll be fine. It's a way of God humiliating me and keeping me humble. Mm-hmm. All right. Look, go back to chapter four. Go back to chapter four of First John for just a moment. Look at the look at the very first two first two uh, verses of this section. Okay. Uh, it says, "Dear friends," this is starting in verse seven, seven and eight. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. How many times is God mentioned? Five times. Five times in the opening two verses on love... God is foremost, from God, know God, of God, born of God. It's always of God, for God, from God. That's the cross. It always begins with God. If you don't get God, you will not understand the cross. And when I say God, I'm talking God Father. God as a, as a collective whole, Okay. So I want to start there. <coughs> we have a difference of opi- we have a difference of opinion in our modern evangelism. Modern evangelism is not God-centered cross. Modern evangelism is man-centered cross. Let me read you what an uh, uh, evangelist once said. His name is Arthur Pink. Says the nature of Christ's salvation is woefully misrepresented by the present day evangelist. He announces a savior from hell rather than a savior from sin. And that is why so many are fatally deceived, for there are multitudes who wish to escape the lake of fire who have no desire to be delivered from their carnality and worldliness. We don't have a cross that demands change. We don't have a cross that deals with sin. We don't have a cross like that. What we have a cross is a cross of a benefit. I go to the cross so that I don't have to go to hell. 
Yippee, let me sign on the dotted line. That's what I want. Let me walk down the aisle and pray some prayer and say, yeah, that's what it is. I don't want to go to hell. But what happens after that? Is there life change? Does sin bother you? Do, are, you, do, are you bought, paid for, slave of righteousness, as Romans talked about? Is that what you are? Not in many people's lives. Many people who go to church. I think one of the major areas that we see this in, it's most evident in, is with youth. We make it very easy for youth to come to Christ. Just pray a prayer. Here, sit down. You just repeat with me. Father God, Father God, Please forgive me for my sin. I'm guilty of sinning. Thank you for sending Jesus to save me and pay the penalty for my sin. Please forgive me. I accept Jesus into my heart. Thank you very much. I'll see you in glory. I'll see you in heaven. Amen. You are in God's kingdom now. Praise God. Let's add you to our numbers. That's about it. That is not the picture of the cross. That's not what Jesus died for. That's not what he paid the penalty for. He didn't die so that he can clean you up a little bit, you know, spit shine you and make you a little bit better. He didn't die so that you could get a get out of jail free card and not go to hell. That's not why he died. He died to buy you. Buy you. That's what redeemed means. He bought you. He stood in your place and paid your death penalty for you. So that God could love you. Because until that death penalty was paid, God could not put his favor on you. Oh, did you just quote that the reason Jesus died on the cross was so that your life dies? So that you no longer have right to your life? He's slaves to righteousness. Slaves to righteousness, like we talked about earlier. We don't talk like that. that. Our evangelism, our gospel message doesn't talk like that. We talk about what can God do for you? What did Jesus do for you? What did the cross do for you? And we walk around with a little chain and we think we're all happy, happy. You know, isn't it amazing that our young people, young, you know, people your age back there, you know, you go through church most of your life and two years after high school, you're out of the church. And God doesn't mean anything. Statistically, yes. All right. So what does it mean? Why is the cross God-centered? All right. First reason is because the cross was God's design and decree. Someone turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. That's one. So. It's God... Centered because it was God designed and decreed. What does decreed mean? Declared. It said this is what this is going to happen. Not well maybe sort of if you want it to happen. It means I say it so. Yeah. Um, I don't want to go back too far, but we're talking about Jesus died to you know, to redeem us, to <coughs> save us of our sins. Um, and as a result of that, you are saved from eternity in hell, but he did not come to save you from hell. Yes. Yes. 
what, still, what, still a big picture, still a big issue, yes, but not yes. the main one. What he's saying is, is that, yes, you are saved from hell as a result of the cross. However, that was not its primary purpose. That was not the purpose for which Jesus went to the cross. It was a byproduct. It was a benefit, but it wasn't a primary purpose. Do you understand what I mean? Okay? Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22. We do 22 and 23. Listen to the language here. Peter is preaching. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Now get this. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by whom? God's set purpose and foreknowledge. Foreknowledge means it was his design. He knew about it. He planned it. It was his set purpose means it was his decree. He said, this is what is going to happen. So how, how was God handed, or how was Jesus handed over? By what? By God's set purpose and foreknowledge. He knew it beforehand. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. Okay. That's one. Why is it God-centered? Because it is God-designed and decreed. What's another one? It is because of God's pleasure. It was God's pleasure to do that. That's Isaiah 53.10. It was in... I'm going to say accordance with God's pleasure. Fifty-three ten. God's pleasure. And I'll do this one here. We'll go Isaiah fifty-three ten. And this one is Acts two twenty-four. Verse 24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And possibly. Possibly. That is an agony. I don't know if it's the full cup or not. We're going to have to look at that again. All right, so that's the next one. The cup... Or the cross was to God's pleasure, in accordance with God's pleasure. It was to honor God's character. Romans chapter 3. So see, this is Romans 3.25, I think. 25.26. <clears throat> How would I say that? It honored God's character. Character. So it was by God's design and decree. It was in accordance with God's pleasure. And it honored God's character. Now, who's got that Romans 3? You got it? Yeah, why don't you read it? All right. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Okay. So why did what was demonstrated? The cross was demonstrate demonstrated what? His justice. His justice. Whose justice? justice? God's justice. Is justice part of God's character? Is God a just God? What does it flow out of? Perfection? Holiness? Nah, not holiness. Wrath comes out of His holiness. What, where, from what does God's justness come from? It comes out of His 
Close. Yeah, what, 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 what? Righteousness. righteousness. It is out of his righteousness. His rightness. Out of his rightness is his justice. He cannot do wrong. Therefore, if there is sin, he has to deal with sin. He has no option. <clears throat> he has to address it. In order to be just, to give what is due, because he is righteous, his holiness has to pour out wrath on the sin or sinner. To justify and, weigh, and balance it all up. If I commit a crime, I pay the penalty. That's justice. That's In some regards, that's justice. In our system, that is justice. You do something that is wrong, you pay the penalty. There's a penalty, and that is called justice. God is just, perfectly just, because he is perfectly righteous. He does righteous all the time. He cannot do but righteous. So he has to give justice. So out of his holiness, he pours wrath to, pay, to deal with sin. Okay. So, where are we? So, the cross gave God Father the ability to pour out his judgment, his holiness, his wrath upon sin so that he stays righteous. Does that make sense? If God said, all right, well, we'll just forget about the sin. That one lie that you lied. We'll just we'll pretend like it didn't happen. Is that perfectly righteous just? No. He has to deal with it. Somebody has to suck up, has to drink that cup of wrath. Someone has to pay that penalty. That's the cross. So God, he pours out the punishment on someone so that he doesn't have to pour out the punishment on someone else. Now, that's only one part. There's more to that because in order to be able to pour it out on someone, that someone has to be qualified to take it. Can I stand in Jesus' place and get everybody to have forgiveness? No. You no, I can't, can I? You have to pay for your own. Can I pay for my own? Do I qualify to pay for my own no. punishment? Can I drink God's cup of wrath? Yes. No. I can? For yours. For mine? No, because Just for your eternal sin? death. Yeah, that's how you pay for your own. That's, what you're that's, that's how, I mean, oh, let me rephrase, let me rephrase that. Can I satisfy no. the penalty on my own? No. Died for you. There you go. There you go. So here's there's that other element. So in order for God's character to be intact, he can never be inconsistent with himself. He cannot just love and ignore sin. He cannot just be completely wrathful, wipe everybody out, and ignore his love. There's that way too. Doesn't it say that he was doing that? What? It said he was let them slide. No, no, he didn't say he was letting them slide. He said forbearing, meaning, look at the people in the Old Testament. When Adam and Eve sinned, what was the penalty of their sin? Death. Yeah. Death. Did they die? No. Why not? Tree of life. Huh? Tree of life. No, nope, they couldn't. They were they were banned from the tree. They couldn't touch the tree of life. Mercy. Huh? Because he was forbearing. He was, put he put it off because Jesus hadn't come yet. What about Abraham? Was Abraham absolutely righteously perfect, completely, totally, 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 never sinned in his whole life? He didn't lie a couple didn't times? He, no. Didn't he mess up with some kind of circumcision thing and God was mad at him and he was going to kill him and then he didn't? Uh, yes, that was with his uh, second, second, third son, I think. There were many times. How about David and Bathsheba? Committed adultery, murder, and dishonored his appointment as king of uh, God's king over the people. What happened? Did he die? Eventually. He should have. 
He should have. Why didn't he? Why could God still say, he's a man after my own heart. I still love him. How could that happen? Because of what Ray read, that God forbear. He knew Christ was coming. In Christ, Christ took all of those sins from before and paid that price. God knew that was coming. He knew that was going to happen. So he could... He, he could put it on hold. Not slide. He has to deal with it somehow. So when Christ is on the cross, not only is he dealing Christ wearing the, the sin of people of that day and future, but he also put on the sin of everybody beforehand. Otherwise, everybody before the cross couldn't have gone to heaven. That's, that's interesting. Because back then, your salvation... <clears throat> it looks as if your salvation was works based because you had to sacrifice and all this to make sure that you were clean. I said mm-hmm. it looks like it. It looks like, but it looks that way because that's the way man made it. Because if you look at Abraham, yes. Abraham, Abraham was crowned. It was accredited him righteousness before even circumcision. Yes. 